Hey guys, welcome back to the Blue Podcast. Today it's me, Carlos and Lloyd. How are you guys doing? Very good. Very good. Really looking forward to this. Great. And today in front of me is Simon Leslie. How are you doing today? I'm ex- outstanding. Good. Very good to hear. Do you want to just let our audience know who you are and what it is you do? I'm Simon Leslie. Um, I stupidly own a football club. <laughs> I'm a sales guru, a magician. Um, I make money disappear very quickly at the minute. <laughs> and um, I love business and I love sport. So hopefully we can talk about things that you guys are passionate about too. Absolutely. That's why we've got you on. Um, obviously, Heli reached out to you, one of our hosts. Um, but unfortunately, you can't make it today. Um, but one of his questions he wanted to start me to start off with was, why East Bombara FC? Why? Do you know how many times I've answered that question <laughs> in the last year? Why Eastbourne? Why Eastbourne? Yes. You know, Eastbourne is the closest place to heaven. Really? Yeah. Oh. People are crying out to get in there. Uh, I say, why not? That's my standard Sorry? answer. Why not? It's by the sea. Yeah. It's a, it's a beautiful seaside place, sunniest place in the United Kingdom. It hasn't stopped raining since I arrived, <laughs> literally. <laughs> it's rainy, it's windy, it's miserable most days. Um, I, I think the thing that attracted me to the to the club, and I looked at a lot of clubs and I talked to a lot of clubs, both from the league downwards, is that I wanted to create a project where I could do something different, not just paper over someone else's cracks, actually start with a blank slate and have a real good go at it. And when I arrived at Eastbourne, I thought, here's a place I can do something special. They've never had a league club. Mm-hmm. It's probably one of the biggest towns in the country that doesn't have a league club. And there's a real opportunity to to make a difference. And I've gone about that since last July. Yep. And we've made some waves. What's the, uh, what's the biggest step in the right direction that you think you've made so far with Eastbourne? Well, I'm the first club to sell a player from the National League South to the Premier League. And I did that in three months. Who, who was it? I, 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 I didn't <laughs> See, I thought you'd done your research. I know, I know, but no, clearly he went not to enough. Wonder as he well. to, yes. Oh, he's done more research than me. Then. <laughs> <laughs> it's a team. It's a team effort. So, so, so the 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 philosophy of the project behind the project is um, looking after players who've been let down by football, or giving them another chance to get back into football. Are the players who've been stressed out by the academy system? Mm-hmm gone back to work decided actually I miss football I wanted to come back so we're, so we're looking at we're looking at players who are who clearly had talent at one point and working out how we can get that back and how we get that passion and that that fire back in their belly but also bringing in players who are playing at, at the league because what what we realized quite quickly is you can't win you can't win anything with kids someone once said mm-hmm. um, so we needed a to mix it and match it to make sure that we got the right the right blend. I think we're very close to that now. All right. Well, um, we've spoken about Eastbourne, but I want to go to the beginning of your, I guess, career. Um, where did you go to university? If you did, didn't go. The life one. The life one. Fair enough. And what was there? What was the first job that you had? Because the first job was door knocking. Really? Yeah, I was selling insurance door to door, and I was a, uh, I guess I was a failure to my dad. He said, well, you got to get a proper job. You can't go out door knocking. Commission only. In the rain. It's a bit like Eastbourne now. <laughs> in the rain, in the wind, in the miserable parts of London, knocking on doors, trying to make a living. And I actually found myself quite good at it, dealing with people chasing you with guns, dogs, shut the door in your face, <laughs> asking you to test out their mattresses, all the weirdest, wonderfulest experiences. Um, and and I really enjoyed it, and I and I really excelled, and I guess that taught me a lot about 
fear, confrontation. And and the weirdest thing happened when I got to Eastbourne. I we we signed up with the local um, Wi-Fi supplier, mm-hmm. and he said, "Would you mind if I brought my sales team in?" I said, "Yeah, of course you can. Bring them in." And then when they arrived, they said, "Oh, this is our door knocking team." And I went, "Oh wow!" And I did a did a session with them and just. I think I inspired them because they all kept coming up to me afterwards. And said, Would you come door knocking with us? And I said, "Sure." I mean, I I think whatever it is, thirty five years later, I still could go and knock on a few doors and and help them close some deals. And and I and I offered it up. They haven't taken me up on it. Yet. <laughs> so that's how I started, yeah. and I'd still do it today. Fair enough. And that's that's how you got that that sales those sales skills was just purely through, I guess, doing it raw. That's just learn, just learning, learning, yeah. learning, learning the hard way. Yeah. You don't learn by being successful. You learn by rejection. You learn by failure. You learn mm. by things going wrong. And if you keep experiencing enough challenges, that's that's when you're really going to find out who you are. Yeah. And what was the what was the step after that? I mean, I went through three businesses, um, property. I, I went into property when it was the greatest recession in the eighties. So as soon as I start, as soon as I start something, it just goes into to chaos. Uh, so I, I failed in property, I failed in textiles, and I failed in media for the first time. And then the second time, I failed, and the third time I got it right. Do you want to tell us about how you got it right? Hmm. And again, that wasn't a, it wasn't like a, an instant no. success. It probably took me 20, 20 years to be an overnight success. But uh, I, I started with this tiny little airline that flew from Beirut to London. It was just after the Civil War in Beirut. And we got quite good at it. And from there, we built a business producing in-flight magazines. And I became the king of the in-flight magazine. And that is that where the creation of ink came in? Yeah. Yes. And uh, we did that. And all the way through... Uh, everyone kept saying to us, ah, this ain't going to last forever, this ain't going to last forever. These magazines are not going to last. And when magazines diminished in sort of late 2007 and eight, most magazines started closing down because they couldn't make it work. We kept going. But I was always worried that uh, that, that day would come. And it never came. Not until March 2020. Whereas in the first nine days of March, I lost, I had 36 magazines at that point. Mm-hmm. And they all got shut down within nine days. Oh, that's a lot of magazines. To we went from 150 million turnover to zero, minus zero. How was wow. that period? Nine oh. days. It was bloody scary. Yeah. And that was my wedding anniversary as well. Oh. It was a mis- miserable wedding anniversary that year. I think it was my 25th wedding anniversary. Maybe not. We'll have to edit that bit out. <laughs> <laughs> but so I lasted much longer in in an industry. And actually now I'm, you know, I'm no longer at Inc. But the magazines are starting to come back. I think I've heard some of the airlines are bringing them back this year. So, especially in a, in a quite digital age, that they're coming back. I think there's something. I don't think the digital magazine works. Not in the, in the you know what they tried to do was turn a print product into a digital product, and that yes. didn't work. Mm-hmm. YouTube, TikTok, you know that that's a they're digital magazines, but they're a different format. Yeah, you can't take one and just transpose it. Yeah, I mean, I, I wouldn't say that. I would be more likely to read one on, a, on an iPad than I, the physical one's always better, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. And there's, there's also, I wouldn't say so much nowadays, but there's, there's, there's that kind of collector's item with a magazine as well. Um, we're going to speak about our, what we do as well on our courses because I know you're interested in that. But uh, one of my lecturers, uh, he used to run a magazine himself, and it was very strange to see because he gave us two examples of the front covers. I was like, I've seen this before. It was very strange for me because I mean. They're clearly that iconic that I've recognised the the front covers of these things. Are there any magazines that you had which you would say were your favourite at the time? Uh, that just triggered a story for me. Oh. I mean, LeBron James is you know he is as good as they come, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And about two years ago, I had him on the front cover of one of the magazines, and he shared it. He liked it. He there is something about being on the front cover of a magazine. You can be on the front page of Forbes dot com. But it's not the same as being on the front page of Ford's magazine. Yeah. And I don't think people realise how powerful it is. You can frame it, you can, you can frame the web page, but it's not the same. Mm, no. And 
when you're on the front cover of a magazine and there's only ever there's only ever one front cover that is something that you know is unique and i don't think it doesn't you know they don't exist anymore they you know there's so few magazines that people don't get that opportunity to just maybe that's a business we we'll just create front covers of magazines and just put you on there and <laughs> they used to do that at disney i think i'm sort of good enough front cover of a magazine <laughs> 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 Um, I mean, yeah, I'm watching uh, The Last Dance currently. Have you watched it? I have. I think it's very good. Uh, I'm not a massive basketball fan, um, but I kind of didn't quite realise until I started watching it. I, kn- I knew LeBron, not LeBron, um, Michael, Jordan. Michael Jordan was so is such a big, big name and household and one of the best of all time. Obviously, there's the argument, is, he, is it LeBron or Jordan? But, uh, yeah, I didn't quite realise how big basketball was in the world I think from a football standpoint p- personally and I, I've got a bit of rugby in, uh, background as well um, but what got you into football specifically I I was about 16 17 and I got sent to Northampton I didn't get sent but I went to work in Northampton it was like I was deciding if I was going to go to university or what I wanted to do I didn't really I was a really crappy student you know the teachers didn't like me didn't think I was very good and it wasn't that it was just I so people learn in different ways and I just felt like the education system was out of date and that was back 35 years ago so imagine how how out of date I think it is today because they're still teaching you the same way And, and and certain people excel in that but it didn't me so I went to Northampton and my one of my dad's friends in Northampton town and I just thought to myself this is you know, so I'm going back a long time I really fancy one day to own a football team so that had been the seed that was sowed and I was just every now and again it would come out and I'd go yeah I'd like to do that I'd like to do that and I kept telling people and actually I don't even remember this but during the pandemic I turned around to one of my coaches and, and told him during one of our sessions that I would own a football team in the next year and he goes, you are the greatest manifester. I said, what are you talking about? He goes, you told me that. I said, did I? He goes, I promise you, in the session, you said you're going to own a football team. And and, and I, just, I just literally started sowing the seeds and going out to people and going, who can you introduce me to? Who can you introduce me to? Just introduce me to football clubs. Let me know which one. Who was, who was available? They're all for sale. Every single one was for sale. How much money you got? I'm like, I don't know. How much money do I need? And it's a weird process because it's not like, you know, there's a for sale sign up and it's yeah. you know two nine nine, you know, plus stamp duty. It's it's a silly process, um, and I can can talk about that for hours. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I think I think most people probably think owning a football club's a bit far away from anyone really, and then you've just kind of said that actually they're basically all for sale if you have the the right know how. How I'm, I'm guessing it's not actually that simple to just own a football club. No, it is. It is. You just pay for it. I think there were some students that bought... Um, so we, we've spoken to Christopher Corey. Um, is I that think, Walsham and Hersham? Yes, yeah. Walsham and Hersham, yeah. yeah. So uh, he, we did a podcast with him, but unfortunately uh, an original editor uh, <laughs> disappeared <laughs> with disappeared with, oh with the God. tapes. With, yeah. with, the, with the footage. Um, but they were, they were just six students, right? Oh, it was just students. And, it, and yeah. it was a bit, And it was a school project. And they've, you know, they've huge success with it, and I think they keep getting promoted, and they'll probably be in our league soon. Yeah, they, I mean, they're what, promoted how many years now in a row? I think five or six. Yeah, it's something, something amazing. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, that would. Would you think that would benefit your league as well, if if them to be in it? Because obviously, of the the social media hype, especially as you want to. With your media empire, I guess I could call it. <laughs> with my media experience, yes. yeah. I mean, I, I do think that you know, the football club is a bra- is a media brand, and it, I want to turn it much more into a media business and, and make sure that we we're benefiting from media spending and, and media exposure. Hashtag, yes, and I can't remember what the other ones, all the other ones' names, but they're they're all using the exposure of of uh, the. The, their their media connections to drive more and more awareness of what they're doing. You know, when hashtag play anybody, they get a much bigger crowd because the, you know, the teenagers come out and watch the games. That YouTube following. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, I'm, I'm 
and I and I hope to meet Spencer very soon and oh, yeah? have 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 good conversations with him because I think there's things that I know that he doesn't, and I think there's things that he knows that I don't. And you know, as far as I'm concerned, for all of us, it's the more you talk to people, the more you learn. Yes, hundred yes. percent. And and listen, you know, listen to what they're saying because that's when you're learning. You're not lear- you're not learning when you're talking. It's funny you brought up a uh, hashtag, actually, because on Wednesday we recorded a podcast with a kit company called Jersey Bird over in America, and they, they've they done the kits for the... Uh, what was it? I've forgotten what the nationality was now. Uh, for one of the Southeast Asian national teams. They, yeah. they have the kit for them. Uh, they're starting with the, you know, the social media football team in Saudi Arabia that's being made. Uh, there's a team that's being made by a influence out there and they're doing the kit for them as well. We actually spoke to him and asked him if he'd heard about Hashtag because it's a social media uh, football team and he said he hadn't. Yeah. And uh, we said, well, uh, <laughs> apparently, I think Hashtag are having some issues with their kit manufacturer. So we said to him uh, to, to check out. I'll show you them after the podcast because the, the, their, their customization of kits I find really interesting. And also, also they're quite big on social media as well right now. So I'll show them after. Jersey Bird. Jersey Bird. Jersey right. Bird. It's yeah. in. <laughs> I logged it. <laughs> All right. Um, um, talking again about Eastbourne, what what do you think or what do you feel is your relationship with the fans and, and the players? So right now that you've been like some time at the club. I mean, I can be really um, timely with that answer because today or yesterday, Talking United went into administration. Yes. yes. Well, so you wouldn't. Yes. About that, yes. yes. I was. Uh, he spoke to me about that this morning. <laughs> yeah, I, I saw you posted it on LinkedIn like an hour beforehand. Yeah, I mean, I wrote a rant today because, you know, me and probably seventy-one other chairmen are sitting there thinking, "Are we going to be next?" Because this is, this is the most dysfunctional business I've ever worked in, and I've and I've had lots of failures, so I know what, <laughs> you know, what works and what doesn't work, and I've seen businesses go through highs and lows. I think the I think the fans now in the last couple of days have been grateful that I'm here and and funding it but but at the same time they are um they're fickle we haven't we haven't delivered we delivered many promises and many things as a as a club in five or six months but we haven't delivered the results you know we're we're, we're towards the bottom of the table I think we've you know, you guys know what XG is, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. In every game, we had a better XG than every team. I think bar one or two. I'm a Chelsea fan. I'm very <laughs> high XG compared to goals. I really would love that. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, we're doing a lot of the right things. We're just not putting the ball in the back of the net. Um, and I think they get frustrated and they blame me and they blame... They'll blame anybody, you know. Fans blame whoever they want to blame. And I think sometimes you don't realise there's, there's something called the cost of change. You know, when you change from going from part time to full time or any business when a new owner comes in, there's a cost of change. There's, there's different situations and I think that's what I'm going through right now. I'm going through what's called the cost of change. You can Google it and it will give you a whole analysis of it. And I've tried to explain it to them. I mean it's been quite good because I've been on podcasts where I've been able to talk to them and share share how I feel about them. Mm. The last couple of games they've been unreal. We're getting a lot of younger louder fans you know Eastbourne was a bit of a older community so you know a lot of the fans were um were grumpy old people and they're even started to smile at me and and I think to be fair I've, you know bar half a dozen or so they, they really are all supportive of what we're doing because they can see they can see how hard we're working you know when you've got 14 injuries in your first team right there's, you know, you're running on a you're, you're running on a tight budget, yeah. and then you've got to bring in loan players, and you've got to spend a lot of time, money getting people fitter. Yeah. I don't think anyone realises how expensive that is, and they just say, "Get more players, get more players," and so, someone's got to pay for them. Mm. So, 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 I've I've got a good relationship with them, but but they're challenging me, and I'm challenging them back, and um, you know, I I know so many of the fans, even by name. Um, so they, so they, you know, they'll come up to me, and I'm quite good remembering people's names. I think Carlos, and um, 
and, 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 I, and I talk to them, and I'm present. I'm a present owner. I'm not one of these owners that you know sits in London and watches it from afar. I'm at every game. I go to every away game, so I, I get to spend time with them and and engage with them. You know, oh, we don't like your bloody TikToks. Why are you doing that TikTok rubbish? Why aren't they training? I mean, it was one the other day, and this is this made me. S- <laughs> I don't want to say angry, <laughs> but discontented. He went, I was by the gym the other day, I saw the players, they were smiling. <laughs> <laughs> they were smiling in oh. the gym. How very dare they? <laughs> they should be miserable, they should be looking oh, grumpy. Yeah. They haven't won a game, they shouldn't yeah. be doing... <laughs> no, fans I act like that. It's not... well, I mean, what do you expect them to be? You yeah. know, they're, in the, they're in a public place. They don't walk around looking morose. They shouldn't be doing TikToks. I don't know why I changed my voice to, to do that. <laughs> they should be. They all sound like this. They shouldn't be doing TikToks. Why not? It's after training. They've just trained for three and a half hours. They have a life. If they, want, if they want to do some content that boosts their own profile, yeah. of let them do it. Of course. I, mean, I don't make anyone do anything. I say, if you want to do it, do it. If you don't want to do it, don't. Let them skin off my nose. Do you, do you think also having players obviously you don't ask them but having players with a bit of a social media following probably helps bring fans into your club as well i think if people understand and get to know the players and, and this is something i've been talking with the with the media team about i said we've really got to start giving them showing their personality off because some of these guys have got great personalities i mean jack paxman who left tail into last year he was cutting people's hair. He was cutting other players' hair. He was, he was a hairdresser. He wasn't qualified, but he was really good at it. Yeah. And I was gonna, we were, we were gonna create you know, his own little TV show of, you know, Jack on the mic. And we, we made a couple of episodes. It was like I wanted to help him raise his profile. And I, I even phoned him the other day and I said, I've got an opportunity for you if you want to come back and, and meet someone. So I, I, I very much committed to all these players that, even if they're playing here, they're not playing here unless they behave badly. I would support them, I would help them, I would be a mentor to them if they had questions outside of football they wanted my help on. I would do what I can to support them and, you know, the the, the more I can do to, to make them stronger humans off the pitch will make them even better players on the pitch. Yeah, no, of course. I think um, when it comes to players like at non-league, of course... They're not full. They're not full-time footballers, are they? They're not getting paid ridiculous amounts of money, like let's say a Premier League. So it's really important for them to have a balance and be able to do all that. And I mean, you're there every game, every home game, every away game. I'm a uh, doing some work experience at Hampton and Richmond with a. Uh, so I'm just a match reporter. So I see Raffaele and Stefano. They're there every week. You don't get that at Premier League level or anything like that like you don't they get go the in the, cr- they go in the crowd they yes go- they, yeah yeah no i've had chats with them i've spoken to them and things like that they are just so in with the fans and that's what i love to see about um owners like yourself as well who are involved it was funny when those two came to uh to us they came in their pinstripe suits double-breasted pinstripe suits they looked like they were extras from a guy Ritchie movie <laughs> right and and they're in the away fans <laughs> and all you can hear the fans go what are they bloody filming now down the end there? Look at them two idiots. And I went, no, no, they're the way directors. Really? <laughs> I mean, they are, they are proper characters. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, they're bringing d- different quality to the game. But in our discussion, they're not, they are all full time. Of, of, my team are full time. Oh, are they? Okay, they're not, they're not getting paid premiership wages, but they're getting paid. Oh. This is their main job. I did not know that. And uh, they train four days a week. Um, some days we're doing double and triple yeah. sessions. So, we we are. Oh wow! We are we are behaving like a league club, even yeah, though we're not. That's, no, that's that very brilliant. that's very impressive for a for national league club. Well, exactly because they're uh, well, the division below the national league, so yeah. it's still the national league. Sorry. But yeah, but still, like you know, there, there are about seven clubs in yeah. in in my league now. That we got Yeovil, we got Torquay, yeah, we got Maidstone. Yeah. I mean, look, look, this year there's been so many firsts for the for the national league south and. You know, I, I actually, and, and I'm championing this, and I'm, what's the word? Um, lobbying. <laughs> I'm saying the American word, lobbying. I'm lobbying the league that we need to do some more work as a league. All 72 clubs. Yeah. There's some absolutely cool and quirky stories up and down the country. Mad chairman, all who've come from way different backgrounds. Cool players, great goals. And I, and I think there's there's a non-league... TV program storytelling that needs to be done because 
I have a friend who lives in Australia who happened to be from the Lake District and you know he used to play for the, the team there and, and he's got no connection with it anymore so for him to learn about what's going on mm. it's great it's great TV so I think that the National League need to do a lot more I think the National League need to lobby the Premier League a lot more for more money to come down because there's no way the business model works at the moment it's flawed and it and you know, people said, oh, it's just mismanagement. They'll just spend more money on players. It's not because of that. It's not because of what they're spending on players. It's what what they have to do. Like, my game tomorrow has now been cancelled. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So at lunchtime on Friday, I've just found out. I've already paid for the hotel. The hotel's not going to pay me my money back. Mm-hmm. The coach company might because they're quite nice. Um, shout out to Nova Bussing. Um, <laughs> but, but I've just lost £2,000. Yeah. And I'm not going to get that back. I've now got to go down there on a Tuesday night, you know, and we're probably going to have to play Saturday, Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday to get all the fixtures in. And they're not, there's nothing I can do about it. Tough titties. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's going to be tough on the players as well. I mean, we, t- we t- I mean, I know at the, especially Premier League level, there's this, uh, I mean, actually probably all professional sports right <coughs> now, it's a massive thing on ACL injuries. I was wondering f- in National League South, is that still a quite a big issue as well? I don't know, South. Go stab me where it hurts. So the first game of the season, we lost a player to an ACL. Yep. Um, we're insured now for our players, but we we weren't at that point. Um, and obviously, I'm my my priority is to make sure that we look after them. So I paid for his mm. surgery. I paid for his rehab to, to go to some of these really unusual because I'm my my goal is to bring a biohacking center into Eastbourne and bring all the latest machines the repair machines so I've got great relationship with the guys who own these machines so I took the players to Harley Street I mean all over the place just to get them on these machines and I think I've got three or four players back about a month early because of that investment in them and even Stefan who's who's not going to play again this season they said to me I might get one or two games in He's already training properly. So, especially if we get all these fixture backlogs, yeah. you might get four or five games in. Every time I see him, I say, three, maybe four. <laughs> Please, <laughs> I've got to get my money back. But, you know, I, I, I made a bit of content with him because, you know, the mental health of a player, once they're injured, is Oof. it's miserable. You know, it's, you sit at home, if they go, oh, great, you watch Netflix, you're still getting paid. But they're as sad as anything because all they want to do is play football. Yeah, they mm. get destroyed. I mean, yeah, your, your dad was a f- football player. Yeah, my, my dad was a prof- he he luckily he never like got injured like for a long time, but he had like a lot of, of teammates that got injured well, for months and months and months. And at that that at that point, like when you're a football player, it's like the only thing you want to do is play, even though like you're getting paid and everything. It, it doesn't matter. You just feel like sad. The, sad. the money doesn't compensate for the fact they're not playing. Of course. Yeah. Well, I, mean, I guess lockdowns probably an example of that as well. I mean, you some people are still getting furlough pay still getting paid to sit down and watch Netflix, but the mental health just plummeted. I mean, we we could go slightly off topic, but, you know, this, this whole work from home versus going into going into work, I mean, I've been, last two days, I, I spend time, can, not counselling, mentoring some young business leaders, and the amount of employees that are broken by that that want to come back into the office because they can't cope anymore at home. You know, I'm like, and I'm talking to this guy and he's in his beautiful studio in the back of his mansion. And I'm going, this isn't work from home. <laughs> this is, there's no dogs barking. There's no kids screaming. There's no TV on in the background. This is, this is, you know, you've got your own little suite. But most people haven't got that. You know, they might be in a one-bed flat and, you know, they're literally sleeping, eating, pooing and, the, and working in the same place. And it's... Never it's really done. hard no. and also I think that you never learn you learn from having conversations around the water cooler seeing what's going on an opportunity might present itself and I go oh let me tell you about this Lloyd I think you'll be great at this if you're sat at home you're never going to get those opportunities so you know I, I hear now the, the the question that people ask most is how much am I getting paid how much holiday do I get and can I work three days from home and I think those candidates shouldn't be hired no, I personally, I kind of not speak for you guys, but I prefer doing work in person, like doing, for example, the podcast in person. I hate doing it online. It's oh, just boy. so much. Yeah, better. I mean, we, we spoke about this all yeah. Christmas break because we couldn't get in the studio. How much podcast we had like online? 
Well, like four or five, it was yeah. horrible. It, was horrible. <laughs> <laughs> it just wasn't the same at all. Uh, it, we didn't, we didn't really have any guests either. We just just started even then. It was, it was tough. So, and and when I'm working, I mean, I work in a pub currently. Uh, you can't really do that from home. No, obviously. Not. <laughs> but I'm saying I prefer, I prefer the the inter like the, the physical human interaction of it. And yeah. as you said, you won't you won't learn as much if you're online. Like if you go into if you go into work, let's say you're working at ninety five, you. How are you going to make friends if all we can see is a square on a screen? Exactly. Work friends are so important. Uh, most of your best relationships will come from people you meet at work. My best friend, who we started door knocking together, who's actually my manager, but then I overtake him. <laughs> I have to keep reminding him of that. But we're still best friends to this day, 33 years later. And he has three Lamborghinis and a, and a, and a slightly different life to me. But we are always pushing each other helping each other and you know doing stuff that, that you know that, that's not the same as a relationship that I had at school which I didn't really but I don't think I've got any school friends but work friends I've made hundreds over the years of people who I've I've interacted with and I just I just think you've got a slightly different relationship with I mean I'd say all of us on the podcast yeah. considering we only really met well no I met, only really met you in November yeah I met Carlos in September and already we're Lifelong friends. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And that's where, and that's where it should be. Well, we want to be happy. <laughs> but I, I did make, I did make a joke at one point when we had so many injuries. I said, you know, we're a football team, but most of our players work from home. And, 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 and it was, it was getting that silly. You know, we lit, we played Hendon, right? And I used to play at Hendon, so I was, I was like looking forward to this. We couldn't even get more than one person on the bench. I think, he, and I think that was like a, you know, a substitute goalkeeper, and it was. Uh, I think we were at one point we said let's bring the goalkeeper on because we got, we got to do something. We got beat, and actually I didn't realise how much money there was in the trophy, and I probably should have done something about that. Be more intelligent. <laughs> I learned a lot of lessons about things, you know, that, and, and again you can only learn from making the mistakes. Who was the Who was the goalkeeper that came on uh, a few weeks ago? Or, just over a month ago, I think it was in lower than National League South. But they brought in a keeper up top, and he scored about a 30, 40 yard half volley. <laughs> really? On the game. <laughs> I saw that. I saw that. I saw that. I yeah, saw that, I, I, saw I, that. I can't, I can't no, remember the current no, team for the life of me. Yeah, I I mean, just, I can pick, I'm, I'm a much more of a picture person. <laughs> so faces, I, I can remember very, very well. But names, oh, the opposite to you. Again. <laughs> names, names not so good. Faces, I remember. I mean, there was actually one of my sister's friends who I saw yesterday. She doesn't remember meeting me at all, <laughs> and it was like a very brief uh, at Manchester graduation high, and then I I already didn't remember exactly who it was just from the face. Yeah. It was very strange, but uh, yeah, it's funny you mentioned the goalkeeper thing because I just put, I put that image of the, of the shot in my head. Maybe you should have brought him one up top. <laughs> you never know, because <laughs> I mean goalkeepers do have uh, a heck of a kick on. Oh, them. I mean, we one of my goalkeepers is is like the third goalkeeper. When when they do the you know the practice, he's unreal. I mean, he's got. A he finishes better than some of the strikers. Well, he does finish better than the strikers. <laughs> I mean, we did discuss it. I mean, you know, we, we've got a, a a big centre back, and he he spends a lot of time in <laughs> more time in their box. Than he does it ours, <laughs> and he's got a brilliant bullet header the other day. So he's he's worked out how to score now. So Oof. I think we figured. I think we've we fixed it now. That's good. Um, <laughs> is there is there anything that you haven't done yet with Eastbourne that you really want to do? <laughs> win some games. <laughs> Apart from the winning the games part, <laughs> win, win three games. Win three games on the trot. Um, well, okay, more on a personal level, I guess. No, I mean, I, you know, I, I did a little sort of tick box of what I've achieved. You know, improving the stadium, selling the player, selling two players to higher league clubs, took them on a um, a week to the Vale. You know, with a preseason, which is something that most non league clubs don't do. Just improving all aspects, helping the disabled team, helping the walking football. I've got a game for the walking football team against Arsenal yeah. this month, wow. next month. You know, so, so they're going to get experiences. Yeah. So it's not just the first team. And I keep saying this, you know, we're not a one team club. We've got 37 teams. Our women's team, you know, when, when I took over, they were, they'd were they lost the first six or seven matches, brought in a new manager, brought in some new players. And I think they've won seven or eight on the bounce. And, um, you know, hopefully they'll get promoted this year. So I'm doing a lot of good things and there's so much more to do. I, I want to develop the stadium. I want to build the biohacking centre. Mm. I want to 
make Eastbourne famous for the sort of the home of where players can go where they're going to get looked after and not get too toxic in the environment. Yes, that reminds me of a question Helly wanted me to ask you. Uh, how important would it be for another team in East Sussex to climb the ranks and eventually play in the EFL as Brighton's the only team in East Sussex to be in the top 92? That's not quite true. But let's let's let's, really let, let's assume he's <laughs> That's right. <what> he said. <laughs> I think Crawley's in East Sussex. Maybe it's in West Sussex. I don't know. Um, it's really important. Yeah. It really is. I mean, and if you go back twelve years, there was only about ten or fifteen spaces between Brighton and, and Eastbourne. Mm. I mean, what Brighton has done is unbelievable. Oh, it's amazing. I went to have lunch with Tony Bloom a couple of weeks ago, and he was very gracious. And you know, I'm I'm a long way away from him now, but he still spent time with me and talk to me and, and I think it's a really important point no matter who it is in the world you can reach out and they will talk to you and you can speak to most people and that's what happened during COVID when business went into flux and I didn't know what to do I started reaching out to some of the most powerful and successful people in the world I said look I've got no money I can't give you anything right now and I might never be able to give you anything but would you spend an hour with my team over Zoom this Zoom thing, which I didn't really know much about at that point, and and just talk and inspire them and tell them just tell them some stories, and I did that, and I did I actually had a, ended up having fifty two people come in and talk, and so I actually wrote a book about everything I learnt, and 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 this is the important part I learnt from having them there, you know I brought it in for my team, and what I realised was they were teaching me things that I could make myself better and could improve, and I wrote them. Every single thing I put it in, everything that I've, everything I've ever done, I've written in four books. Mm. So every one of my secrets of success, I've already, it's there, it's documented. People can take it and share it and read it. And so when people say, you know, I'd like to spend some time with you, you let me buy your coffee. I said, have you read my books? He goes, no. I said, well, do that first and then we can have that conversation. Yeah. But people will respond to you. I wrote to Tony, I said, Tony, can I? This is who I am. This is what I don't. I'm your. I'm your. I'm your neighbour, and I drive past your club every day, and I got. I've had football envy, and would you? He said, "Come and have lunch," and I think that's really important. That the more people, the more successful people you reach out to in life, you'd be surprised how many of them will respond to you because successful people understand that if you help more people, one, it's calm, karmatic, or energetically positive. Um, and they and they want to see people succeed, and they want to see people who've got that sort of get up and go. Oh, I, I, I wanted to ask as well because I don't know, you know about your books. What was it like actually writing a book? My uncle's a, an author as well, so I was intrigued to see what you. I, 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 I found it. You know, bear in mind that I was a school dropout, <laughs> and my English teacher called me funny names, and although he was French Welsh, so I don't know how, how he's <laughs> equipped to teach English. I'm Welsh, by the way, so it's okay. I can I can say that. And um, I had a really good editor, but actually, she turned around to me and said to me, "Your writing is really good. You like you you write very creatively." And I went, "It's just what's in there, and I'm just, you know, I'm brain dumping it. You know, I might not put a comma in the right place, or I might not, you know, know where to put the apostrophe. But actually, this is this is you know, I'm telling a story." And and all of the books are stories, and if you just tell a story, you know you just. What I would do is I sit there at the end of the day and I just type and write it, or even the last one I started dictating it, just dictate that story and then let it be transcribed, and then they come back and I go, actually, I don't like that. I don't like that story. Or I, oh, oh, actually, that's reminded me. So it's it's a really simple process. Mm. I mean, there's um, there's quite a few people now on the internet who literally will write book for you just give them the content it, yeah. and then if you really don't want to write it just get a chat gpt and <laughs> ask them to write it for you <laughs> at this point, uh, every student right now basically yeah. <laughs> but but you know i, I went on to, to there yesterday and i was i was writing a brief for something and i said write a brief for me and i'm like bloody hell this is good i mean what the hell do we need to do anymore i mean it's like no it's, it's impressive it's amazing how that thing works and, and from a, from a marketing point of view, if you want a, a marketing plan or a marketing program, mm -hmm. <laughs> that's a good point. Actually, we probably should utilize that a bit. Yeah, <laughs> 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 uh, definitely should. But but it's even things like you know, Canva, something like that. Oh, I, I 
very aware of that. Every single, you know, every single set template and stuff. You don't, like you don't even have to design anything anymore. It's just, you, you know, anyone can go in, design stuff, and you look like you've paid the big agency to do your work for you. Yeah. I mean, and I, and I, I just think that's crazy. Our road logo was just me on Canva in 2020. Absolutely no digital um, ed like editing, no how to self taught, and I still managed to make a nice profile picture. Uh, I want to try something a bit different, which I actually haven't done with a guest, because I know you wanted to ask us about our courses, obviously UCFB as well, which we're very lucky to have the studio in. Is there any questions you have for us? Because we actually haven't actually asked this from a, from a, from a guest before. Mm -hmm. So I was, I was intrigued to see what we could get from this. <laughs> <laughs> well, here we are in the shadows of Wembley Stadium at yes. the beautiful UCFB, which we promote widely in mm -hmm. our programs and on our, on our website um i think what what's really interesting in the in the in the brief conversation that we had beforehand is that passion for sport and business and you know I, i've written to quite a lot of people here and we don't get many people going I think Eastbourne, you don't want to come to Eastbourne, you know, I guess if we were Crystal Palace, Arsenal or QPR, you yeah. might go and do some work. You know, I would say, come, come and work and do some stuff with us. Because actually from a access, from being able to really learn and grow and be mentored, I think I offer a really interesting perspective that not many people will give you in terms of a football club. And, you know, I, I had a, a young lady at the game on, on Tuesday, who's at Portsmouth, but from Eastbourne, but studying business mm. of sport, and she said, "Can I ask, come?" And I said that to everybody, "Come, come, 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 work with us." We, we, you know, I, I have a very lean media team, and you have seen how much content we've produced over the last. And you know what the the most flattering bit about that is? How many people are copying what we're doing? Even even some of the big teams are starting to copy some of our TikTok formats. Really? Yeah. So either we weren't very original, I didn't notice it before, or or, or they're away. being copied. Yeah. How how big is your your media team actually? Two people. Two people. Okay. Fair enough. So, what 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 do you think that you're learning, and where do you think it's going to be useful? Uh, is that generally or to me? Uh, you can all answer it. Because you you're all <laughs> doing you're all doing slightly different programs, right? Yes. 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 So me and Carl are both doing masters. Um, we had a module together last year, last term. Sorry. Um, which was fine engagement, um, which was actually, it, I was going to ask you a question, but we, we went somewhere else about um, fan typologies, because obviously you talked about how you what? typologies, so like your, how, the different types of fans, basically. Yeah, um, and we can come back to that. Yeah, we, 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 you spoke about um, how you're getting younger fans <coughs> and how important that is. Um, yeah. That was something we learned about as well. Um, yeah, and then you're, you're a first year as well. Yeah. So, slightly uh, different. So, on, on, the, on the fan engagement, or the f typology, is that, uh, an old fan will sit there and complain and hide behind Facebook. Mm -hmm. A younger fan will complain on that, uh, on Twitter, on X. Yes. And then you'll get the one in the middle of the road who will complain on all of them, <laughs> right? My ultras, I mean, we put um, GoPros on the ultras, on the kids. And it was, I mean, it was the most unbelievable content. And now we've got another group who've just seem to have appeared who are sort of 16 I think 15 16 year olds I did a lot of talks at the local schools and I think I've I've attracted a few more of those and they sing and they chant and they make songs up about the um about the players and 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 to me it's starting to to feel like a football club now with you know and they ask me to give them a wave and and I, and I just think it's you know, it's it, it's a great environment, and and I don't know how I can, you know, I would ask you that. How would you, if you were running a football club, what would you do to get more and more f younger fans through the door? I mean, social media is obviously the the biggest tool to to use. Um, that's a very good question. Uh, I think it's social media. I think actually, actually, I'd say it's getting to know the players. I think, especially with the younger generation, especially with your YouTube stars, your TikTok stars. The big thing always is, are they related? Like, it, to an extent, are they relatable? Obviously, you've got your Swifties and people that are Harry Styles fans, and they're, I mean, they're beyond whatever. But I mean, for for uh, people growing up with YouTube and TikTok, and even Instagram to an extent, if you can get to know 
the person behind the camera you then create that bond and you're more likely to go back and back and back and so go you're back you're gonna invite them with the players obviously uh, i mean yeah, side sidemen for example i mean they're a super team of people of, of seven guys i mean if there's a lot going on behind the scenes but the reason they work is they're relatable in to someone because they're all from varied backgrounds to an extent like one some some private school some non-private school some drop out some went to university they can someone can relate to them in, in some way so i guess with the players if you can get the fans to relate to the players in some way then i think that would be huge yeah i think the um <coughs> lunch with one of the sponsors he said look I'm a, I'm a kid from the council estate here in Eastbourne, like one of the roughest estates. And Eastbourne, you know, where we are, is actually one of the poorest parts of the UK. And he said, the thing that people don't realise about the UK is it gives you an opportunity to be nobody to be somebody. And, you know, everything I did, I did off my own back. And I, and, and I, my, my, my net worth was my self-worth. It was what I, what I created off, mm. off of my own limited abilities as my teachers told me and that that's something that's quite unique and you know I, I offer a, when they, they don't play on a Wednesday or Thursday I say to the guy, any of the guys come in and if you want to spend an hour with me have a coffee and just chat about stuff come in and, and do it only one has taken me up on it and that one said to me if these guys realised what they've got access to and they're not using it it's criminal and I, and I think it's you know sometimes you don't know what you've got until it's not there anymore but I will keep doing that and I'm going to keep committing to supporting them and, and helping them so go on tell me about you and your course well <coughs> so what I want to do like when I finish my course is to be a football agent and get the contracts and all of that and uh, no, for example my, our our first class that we did this this semester was about football finance and how like all the accounts work in a football club. And I think like for example, for um, from an agent's view, it's very important because there's a lot of clubs that look like they're doing like really good financially. And if you look in the accounts and how like the, some money is deposited in some parts and how, the, how everything works, you see like maybe um, financially, the club that you are taking your player to is not good like for the next five years. So it's you know, there's a lot of agents. Wow, we can have a whole con whole I mean, <laughs> podcast about agents. You know, there's there's the fake Rolex, banged up Mercedes, bad shoes, mm -hmm. vape smoking agent in a cheap suit. And and there there's two people that kill footballers more than anybody else in the world. Do you know what they are? Quick fire question, come on. Ooh. One of them agents. Agents. Yeah, agents. Yeah. And, and injuries? Dealers? That's a very, very strange thing to say, <laughs> but I was just guessing. What sort of dealers? Managers? Drug dealers? Yeah. No. Managers? No. Mm. Players themselves? No. Come on, Lloyd. I can't think of one. <laughs> family? <laughs> Put me on the spot. Family? <laughs> Parents. Parents. Parents are the worst. Dads, especially. Just, just absolutely kill kids because they think they know better and. You know, they think they should be doing this. You know, I, I've had a couple of experiences of it. And, and I'm a dad with a player in the team, so I know how tough it is on him mentally when he's not playing. Even when he's playing and the abuse he's getting. And it's it's really, really hard. The amount of kids I've, who haven't come to me because of agents making really poor decisions, mm -hmm. probably a dozen this season already. Even though the player loved the, you know, they talk to me, they're quite excited about what we're doing here and what we want to do, and they want to come here. And then it'll be a money conversation, and then it'll be a, well, what are you going to pay me as the agent? We don't pay agent fees. If you don't pay agent fees, the agents will not give you players. Now, I'm very good friends with, a, with probably five or six of the biggest agents in this country, just that I knew before football, and they all told me not to buy a football club, by the way. <laughs> um, and some of them are really good. Some of them have got really bad reputations. Mm -hmm. And it's a bloody hard game, because on the young players, you don't really make much money. You know, and then you'll get your, you get your, you know, your golden ticket players, and then you might make some money. But someone, someone like Jamie Vardy didn't move 
long time. At all, right? Yeah. I mean, he might have made a little bit of money at Fleetwood, but imagine what Fleetwood would have been thinking when when Arsenal were coming in and were going to pay him. They're thinking, wow, I'm going to get a payday here. And he didn't go. And the agent was thinking, wow, I'm going to make a lot of money now. Didn't go. So... It's it's a you know it's it's a really hard job. It's a bit like being an estate agent in a recession. Like you, know, you can show lots of properties, but no one wants to buy anything. Mm. Or a shoe salesman, you know, you've got to put up with people with smelly feet and still keep showing the shoes on. But there's a lot of agents. Mm. You know, you've got to decide who, your your style as an agent. What you're going to be, who you're going to be, what sort of players you're going to look after. What's your difference? What's your point of difference? You know, what's your because when I talk to a lot of agents, I don't think any of them have got a a brand of who they are and what they stand for, uh, and and I find it, uh, you know, when I, and I and I like to have these conversations because I like to get deeper than, you know, you got this player, great, you know, maybe we'll sign him, maybe we won't. Tell me about him. Tell me about this. What's his family situation? What you know? What why, where Where's the weakness? What's why hasn't he succeeded? Like, you know, they're peddling this player who's been to 15 clubs. He's, oh, he's a superstar. He's a striker. He scored four goals <laughs> yeah. in three years. Not much of a striker, is he? I've got plenty of those. I scored four goals. <laughs> 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 um, so, so, you know, what do you want? You know, what would make him happy? You know, mm. is it the money he wants? Is it something else? You know, a lot of players want to play full-time football, you know, going back to your point. Yeah. Some people actually don't want to play football to play full time because they want a job, so they get an income and they get an, a supplementary income from football, and yeah. they don't have to train every day. So you've got to find the right club for the right players. And some some of the players I've got are the right players in the wrong club, and some of the players I've got are the right players in the right club. But it it's not an easy formula. No, no. We we we're uh, pretty tight on time now. Is there anything else that anyone else wants to ask? Well, I wanted to ask something, but it's like more, more out of football and well, in this conversation, uh, I've seen one of your podcasts. It said like you went, you've been like more or less like to eighty-three countries, something like that. What would you say is like one of your best experiences abroad? <sighs> my favorite country, my favorite places are the Maldives, <laughs> South Africa, <laughs> Cape Town. <laughs> Climbing, climbing. Um, I've climbed Kilimanjaro. I've climbed Table Mountain. I've done two Sahara, two marathons across the Sahara. I've done a, a half Ironman in Phuket. You know, I've really. I like to do experiences in places. I played football on the beach in Brazil. Oh, and <laughs> you know, every year, this is this is what we used to do as a business. We used to write what was called a letter to ourselves. Mm. So 31st of December, every year without fail, we'd write a letter from the future. So from 2025, December 25, dear Simon, this year you achieved this, this, and this. And we actually, and we wrote it as if we'd achieved it. And when you start out, you know, you're not too, you're not too aggressive. By the time I'd finished, I'd, you know, I'd, I'd flown to Moscow in a private jet for my 50th birthday. And even when I wrote that, I was thinking, there's no way I could achieve that. But there's something that happens when you write down something that you want to do. There's a, a synapsis in your brain that starts going to work and goes, we're going to figure it out. Also, if you share with other people what you want, you might be surprised how many people will want to help you as well. Yeah. And on that note, I think that's the best way to wrap up the podcast. Thank you very much, Simon. A pleasure. Thank you very much. And, uh, Thank you for having me. Podcast, uh, I'm sure you can check out Simon's books, check out Eastbourne. Uh, football club which is a borough football club my bad and uh, we'll see you guys next week for another blue podcast thank you see you then see you guys <laughs>